Hi, welcome. Greg Perry here for the Historic Preservation. This is our uh, Envoy Premier uh, program, and uh, welcome to the Sign of the Key Tavern, New Jersey's oldest colonial tavern here in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. Come on in. Hi, I'm just going to explain uh, essentially what was done with the tavern. Uh, when it was found, uh, the walls were missing a lot of plaster, and it led to some further research, and, and we found the, uh, the boards or the planks that we see on the wall today, these rough-hewn hand timbers. They were blackened with mold and other things and, and uh, stored in a very damp environment, so they had to be dried out, uh, cleaned up, hand-planed, and put back on the walls uh, as they were originally. So originally, you're entering into the hearth room here, and this is coming through the front door, which you just saw me enter. And uh, this was a, a fur trading center, essentially, by John Shivers. Um, he, he laid the groundwork in 1650. And what Shivers was really after with this was uh, he was granted thousands of acres by the King of Jersey to, to populate and expand West Jersey. So he needed a venue, and he felt this would have been a copy of like the public houses that we see over in England. So he felt that on a main trail coming from the Salem area, heading up, which would later be King's Highway, or King's Highway would be just down the road a bit, uh, would be a great place for visitors to come and, and purchase land and, and to have conferences here in the tavern. So uh, that's how Shiver set this up. And so let's get back... Uh, Coming through the front door, these type of taverns would typically have only one window. Uh, so to my left in the front there is the one window and coming through the door. Alcohol was one of the greatest commodities of the 18th century as far as value goes. So in the back of the tavern, there would be no windows because obviously it would be a threat um, for people breaking in. Actually, patrons who were actually sitting at tables and if the owner or the bar bartender left there, they could take the, uh, they could take the liquor and go out the window. So uh, no windows in the back, just one window in the front and, and one window upstairs. That's all we had. But coming in the front, uh, obviously the tatter, tavern has been just a tad bit modified. And as we look up to the ceiling, the uh, bathroom was put in in 1948. So obviously the pipes are there, but you would come in to your left and there would be a staircase going up. And that would be sleeping quarters in the top of the tavern. Two rooms with planks, just as we see here horizontal planking in the circumference of the room. So when you came in and if you chose to purchase um, just to stay for the, for the night, you would be giving a burlap blanket, burlap. And it, one room had accommodations a little more upscale. It contained two beds in the Shivers Tavern. Um, up to four to six people would sleep in a bed. These are people you knew nothing about. They're just riders coming through. You get a blanket, you hop in bed, you try to stay warm and body heat was essential. And it was uh, mattresses made out of corn cob husk and some uh, various other things. So the stairway was located here. We talked about the walls. The floors had been pulled up. They were stacked downstairs in the, in the same wretched condition as the planking. Cleaned, hand planed, put back down with restoration nails and old nails. And as we uh, look at the, the, the dividing wall of the downstairs here, um, this wall would not have been painted in the period because paint was such a valuable, valuable commodity. The, the cost to build this dwelling in 1669, it would have been four times the cost to paint the outside. So the last place we would find any kind of paint would be on the inside. So this was painted sometime in 1946, and uh, so it's been a bit updated. So it's the same, same tone and hue of green that's been used. It's a very thick wall. It's a 30-inch wall. Now, why is that? Because over in the corner, uh, next to the, the hearth, there's a door behind the hutch, a very small door. And it's where the tavern owners, the tavern owners could come over, slide the hutch over, get in the door. They have to kneel to get in the door, and the staircase goes up here. It's very narrow, again, about two feet on the inside. And you could get up if there was any problems, any, any ruckus going on up in the sleeping area. Fights were breaking out all the time because people were intoxicated, terminally intoxicated in these taverns during the 17th and early 18th century. So we have a hidden staircase in the wall. Right behind here, in the day, 
there, there's an opening. So the, the food would be pre prepared here at the hearth and it would be shoved through. And I liken it like the horn and hard art you met you, for you older folks in the 1960s and maybe the early 70s uh, in Philadelphia. They would have a, you, you, they pull the food out and they slide it through a door opening. But that's actually in the wall here behind the hutch. So let's, uh, in, in, in addition to, these are original um, floorboards on the second floor above us, original hand hewn timbers. This tavern is composed of primary timber frame construction. White oak, white oak was resilient to fungi, uh, rot, damp, everything. It was the best wood going in the period. The heaviest and some of the most difficult to work, but it was the mo with the most longevity. Um, so these are original hand hewn. You can see the hand hewn marks of the adze and the axe here. They would have taken a timber, a round timber, approximately 18 inches for this one one uh, floor joist here, and you would have a man stand on it with an adze and go down and chip and chip and, and chip and make this into a square timber. So what you're looking at here is about four and a half inches by nine inches. So primary construction in taverns was based a lot on dimensionality as compared to secondary and more contemporary balloon type framing. So that tells us that's a date, that's a dater from maybe the 1670s, 1669 when, when the tavern was built, up until 1700, primary timber frame construction. And to, to, to finalize, we have a hearth with a herringbone uh, back. Uh, it was just meant to add a little bit of uh, upscaleness, uh, you know, a little bit of visualness. And you can see as the fire goes, the fire is kind of black in the back of the fireplace. So, uh, so just a lovely little added touch here. And uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go around the room and talk about all the accoutrements. How do we know what was in the tavern? Because nine, nine generations to date, someone has presented 12 diaries of John Shivers starting in 1650 when he arrived here from Monkstown, Ireland. So I know exactly the conditions of the day from his diary that this tavern was built. I know exactly how he acquired the lumber, the timber for the front door. And I know everything that was in here for the next 30 years as this tavern operated. Every piece of furniture, how he acquired it, it's all written down in diaries. We have inventories also. Copies of the, uh, copies of the license that he got from the you know, the lo local Quaker authorities to be able to sell alcohol eventually. So very, very invaluable stuff. So that's all being uh, transcribed and conserved by, by a paper conservator right now. And uh, we'll release that at a later time. But uh, so all that being said, so we know a lot about this tavern, probably more than most taverns anywhere. And it just happens to be the oldest tavern that we know of in the state of New Jersey, celebrating its 350th year in 2019. So we're, we're going we're to work our way around the room and, and talk about the, uh, the furnishings, the accoutrements of this tavern in 1669 and if anything was added at a later date because not everything. So we're talking about a, a tavern that from 1669 it ran for, for 57 years it was open. So things were changed simultaneously. So we're going to talk right now we're presenting a tavern basically around 1695 to 1710 what was in this room and this is the hearth room so what would occur here you would have uh, potential patrons coming through the front door and uh, we have our table in front of us a long harvest type table which is early 18th century and you would have had a Native American sitting here so John Shivers had a great relationship with Na Native Americans he employed almost 20 of them he had a sawmill in Woodstown Lake where all the timber from this dwelling and the Shivers house which is connected just adjacent all that timber was milled. He owned a sawmill and there's a small, small dwelling down there and he put the Indians up to live there. So they did all of his cutting. But anyway, back to the, uh, the tavern here, you'd come into the opening room, the hearth room, and you would have somebody sitting at the harvest table and they would be buying, selling and trading furs with a potential customer. So this was just more than a tavern. So this was a, a place where people were coming to, to buy furs, to make clothing and such like that. This person would also take an order, this, this Native American. He, he wants to know, are you here to get full service? Full service would have been a meal, would have been ale, uh, a beer, or rum. So you could have one choice of beverage. You could have one 
the only meal of the day, because only in this kind of bucolic tavern was one meal being cooked. You take it or leave it, and then you would go be seated through that doorway in the other room, and it would be brought to you by the individual who was doing the cooking. Okay? So, back to the hearth. Okay, so we have our, our original hearth on the fireplace, and uh, this, this is something that usually occurred uh, after the tavern was closed. Someone would put a, a Kentucky or Pennsylvania long rifle and, and curled maple up here. You would have never had this over there, but in years, recent years, this was displayed here over the hearth. That's just how things were as traditions go, but never here, obviously. You can see, you can see the blackening here as the fire was roaring up probably and actually singeing the oak timber. So you, you sure would not have a gun here. But uh, you're looking at an original crane and original 17th and 18th century fire accoutrements in the open hearth. You have an, an eight and a half foot wide hearth here. You could have had a number of fires occurring here. Uh, using different types of pans, you could, you know, you could break down to have three, four, five fires cooking many different things at one time simultaneously. So the chef at that time had to be quite articulate and quite versed in this type of cooking. So we have all of our casts. These, these have all been seasoned. These are uh, all conserved and, and actually ready for a meal. We may be offering some meals uh, may come a year or so here at the Shivers House on, on select nights, you know, for not-for-profit organizations. So as we come around, we have various strainers, some in cast iron, some in bronze, some in brass. We have a plate warmer, but this, this is a bit later. This is mid-18th century. So this would have been, this would have been an add-on at some time. So you would have put your plates in here and you built a small fire in the hearth and kept the plates warm because on the other side, there's, there's, no, there's no heat, there's no warmth. So you want to give them as hot as plate as possible with the food coming in. Uh, we have a, a step back hutch here dating back, oh, probably around uh, 1690, and this is out of pine, very bucolic. Um, we, have, we have containers for sugar, flour, wheat, whatever was required for the, for the cook or for the chef, rather, in the, in the hearth. And we have a, uh, a flint igniter, which is to ignite candles. It was a conversion by the gun maker to uh, light all the illumination we have. And as you can see, illumination is very important here because this is a dank, dark place with very few windows. And uh, we have an original candle sconce up here with, with nine lights, nine candles, and two reproductions on the side. It's the only reproduction items we have in the entire hearth room here at the sign of the Key Tavern. These are very, very difficult to find out in the market. And we continue to look and upgrade things to make them as, as authentic as possible compared to the inventories and diaries through the years at the tavern. And as we said earlier, this is a, a six and a half foot hearth table. It actually, the top lifts off, it's pinned in, and this table can be tilted up against the wall. That's how it was designed if you had a larger hearth room. We have a whole a plethora of, of Windsor style chairs dating from the early 18th century. Various paint schemes on these chairs, and this is how it would have been a this and that type chair affair. Um, you were in the backwoods here, this was poorer than poor, and you needed what you could find to, to fill the void for uh, seating furniture goes. And you can see our, our oak timber frame truss here, our post. Um, coming over, we had storage inside of here, a, a original door. Uh, we have a butter churn, and whoever was doing the cooking, the chef, would have been churning butter back and forth and going out for water and things of that nature. And we have a, a corner cover, which was found in, in, the, in the diaries. And uh, some, of the, some of the more prized pewter would have been put in here. We're showing here in, in the whole hearth room of the sign of the Key Tavern, all period pewter, um, all English pewter, because all this was coming from England, not from the, from the colonies at that point. And uh, typical colonial colors on the inside, a mustard. Uh, uh, we've done paint analysis on the walls in the repaint, paint analysis in the cupboard. It has several other coats of acrylic paint. We went down and found the original and we restored it as such. In the, when the tavern opened in 1669, John Shivers had brought over by boat or had brought over by boat a long bench. So when you would have a, a wagon coming through, two or three or four or five people or a 
several horses with, with riders. They needed a place to sit, and this is where they would sit. And he had brought this over from England. This is a pew that sat in the uh, Salisbury Cathedral in Salisbury, England. And uh, somewhere in the late 17th century, they did a redo. They did an upgrade, a, a model change of their uh, cathedral. And these were for sale to the general public. And John Shivers had someone send this over to him. And uh, we're so pleased it has Salisbury Cathedral carved in the back and a date. Uh, so a real really a, a cherished piece of antiquity here. And then we have lift up seats for storage underneath, which is a, just a wonderful added feature, original hardware. And on the wall, we have a pine plate rack. You would have all, always had a, a plate rack with pewter uh, 10 and 11 inch plates. Uh, we found in, in, the, in the diaries that this corner cupboard was secured and uh, brought here. It's out of pine. It's very bucolic, very rustic. Just, just take a look at the denticulation on the, uh, the curved molding around the top as it embraces the keystone and the, uh, the other denticulated molding going across the top of the corner. So very primitive stuff. Has a plaster concave back inside, original. So uh, it's lath and, and three-phase horsehair plaster. So just a lovely uh, addition in 1700. And, uh, you know, displaying the, the finer pewter coffee and, and uh, creamers and things like that. So just uh, wonderful. So this is around 1700 or so. This piece found its way into the sign of the Key Tavern. And, you know, lastly, one of, one of the tr truly great, uh, you know, accoutrements on the door is the hardware. Original hardware on this door, this lock is dating back to 1669. I've rebuilt the lock, I've created a key, and this lock does work. So uh, very fortunate to have this on our peen front door. And for you out there, just take a notice of the height of the door. It's the openings right about here. So it just tells you the nutritional uh, advantages we've acquired in the last several hundred years. And take, uh, take a look at the original strap hinges on this door holding it together. But uh, uh, just a phenomenal piece of antiquity here. But uh, So next we're going to head over into the uh, cage bar room. And um, once someone's food and drinks were acquired, uh, they would be delivered by one of the Native Americans working here to one of our, uh, our three tables over in the cage bar section. So let's take a walk over there. Hi, welcome to the uh, Son of the Key Cage Bar Room. Um, it gets its name appropriately from uh, the structure behind me. Contrary to popular belief and myth, even among some historians, the bars were always made out of wood. It would have been way too expensive, particularly in a bucolic tavern like this, 1669. So this actually tilts up in a way and locks to the ceiling when the bar is in use. And uh, we have one of the owners or one of the uh, the operators or one of the, quote, employees inside the bar. He would have to come through this side. There's a lid that lifts up, a door, and he would get in. He'd be totally locked in because just imagine if somebody's trying to, to hold him up for, uh, for the, the liquor that's inside. As we said before, liquor was a very hot commodity. So at night, this would be pulled down and locked in on both sides, and the liquor would be secure. Um, and again, we talked that the operator or the, the bartender so to speak, would be inside for patrons in the room and or for the oldest drive-up window in the state of New Jersey, 1669. And uh, a carriage could pull up or a rider on horse and he could find himself asking for an ale, a hard cider, or rum. And just a word about rum, rum was locally made uh, and they feel it was not the best rum to have, but uh, the rum coming out of uh, Eng England or uh, the Philadelphia or other areas later in the period, which was much preferred. And a lot of that rum was being made by molasses coming out of the Caribbean, you know, and this was all dealing with the slave trade. So talk about the, 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 uh, the cage bar here is made out of uh, white and southern yellow pine. It, this was disassembled. As far as we know, 175 years ago, maybe 200 years ago, put into a, a, a box and stowed away. And again, it was full of mold, it was full of damp, and it had to be cleaned and re-hand planed and, and, and basically refinished. But at least we have original fabric sitting here as our cage bar, so very important. One of the very few taverns in the entire colonial era that we can say is original here. And architecturally speaking, we're gonna walk around the room a little bit just to explain what's in the uh, cage bar room. We have the, the paneling, which is uh, called a wainscoting, but this is a wagon scoting or wagon side scoting it was called. Horizontal boards were placed 
as uh, a wagon would have had in the period. You could lift the sides off to make it more of a flatbed variety. But anyway, so there, there's no raised panels, none of that. This was to protect the walls from the patrons banging, kicking, and, and, and all the ruckus that could go on in an in establishment like this. And then it was topped off by a slate molding. The walls are out of lath and three-phase plaster. We have original floorboards from 1669 above us, and we have original hand-hewn floor joists above us, and you can see the hand-hewning. And unfortunately in here, probably somewhere in the mid-18th century, uh, who, uh, the, the shins were owning the house at that point, and what they wanted to do, they wanted a plastered ceiling. So they would have lathed it this way and did a three-phase plastering job. So thank God someone in the early 19th century, the first 20 years, pulled the lath down and we're looking at what this tavern looked like originally. So that's a great thing. Um, the windows, you would have never had these two windows. So when this tavern, as we referred back in the early part of our, our, our talk, this tavern was moved here in 1724. So it was located where routes 40 and 45 are on the corner, actually where the corner bar stands in Woodstown. So if you want to be a purist, this was the original corner bar, oldest tavern in the state of New Jersey. But what happened was John Shivers, the father died. Samuel Shivers owns the house right through the doorway there. Two years later, Samuel Shivers has two children. He needs more room for, for his, his kids. So what happens is his father died. He wants to sell the land, which is 1.8 miles up Route 40. So he ends up selling the land. He thinks, well, I can have a couple of Native Americans, a couple of his, uh, they weren't his employees, but he, they were friends who he would barter food with, disassemble the tavern from there, label everything, the timber framing, every brick in the fireplace was, was labeled. We have this in the Shivers Diaries. All the wainscoting here was labeled. The bar was labeled. It was undone, pulled by two oxen on a drag sled, the 1.8 miles and reassembled to Samuel Shivers house, which is right between there. So for almost no money for bartering for food for a month, the house had doubled in size. How, how good is that? So we had, when it was doubled to balance the front of the location here, which would later become 68 North main street, two windows were added at that time of the reconstruction of the house to make the house look symmetrical. So, you would have never had these windows here. Now, where we are here with, uh, I've been doing a sympathetic restoration for the entire dwelling, the quote Shivers House Museum for the last four years, where we are with these windows, these windows have unfortunately were replaced in 1946. And they're replaced because someone thought they were doing a great thing by decreasing the number of panes. Originally, there were 12 over 12 lights. Um, I and the, the Service Conservation Workshop have recreated these by hand by molding planes. So these windows are about ready to go back in. And the windows in this house, in this tavern, and, and the Sam, Samuel Shivers House Museum would have had glass, flat glass made from Casper Wister in Alloway's town, the first glass making establishment in the colonies. And we're going to be doing a later show about this, maybe two or three down the road, um, about the first and earliest glass making in the colonies. So going around the room, we, we touched base with the ceiling. The floorboards were the same. They were taken up and, and a parquet floor was actually put down instead of this. So these have been refurbished and the original floorboards put down with restoration nails or reproduction nails. Um, we spoke about this wall, this wide center 30. It's actually 31 inch wall possibly. Would not have been painted, would have been original at that point. If it stayed original, it would have been severely oxidated, very dark, but unfortunately someone's painted it in the early teens. But as we said, there's a stairway going up here. It would have been for the employees or the owner that he could get up there quickly if there was a ruckus or something going up on the two bedrooms in the top part of the tavern. And here's a pass-through window where the, the Native American that was cooking once that order was placed, it would slip through, and then the server would take and have taken the plate and placed it on one of the two or three tables. Actual, in actual fact, except for the filming of the video, there was another small table here. So life in this tavern was cramped. It was extraordinarily cramped. You couldn't get up. You had to push your chair this way or that way to move around. So real estate was a real premium here. In addition, very fortunate tonight, our candles are burning down, but we are under the total ambiance of candlelight tonight. This is how it would have looked in the 18th century. So where can you find a total 
uh, ambiance uh, like this anywhere in any, any tower that exists today. Nowhere except here, 68 North Main Street in Woodstown, New Jersey. Um, candles, let's take a talk about candles briefly. At times, the owner of the tavern would have had the uh, employees or, or some of his uh, Native Americans and, you know, the people he's bartering with make candles. They would have been dipping candles outside. Candles were one of the most expensive things. This was the electricity of the day. Um, candles could cost up to, you know, one, uh, one nickel. So just imagine it cost the equivalent of one nickel to spend a night here to have either an ale, um, an ale or cider or rum, one entree, sleep upstairs, have your horse boarded outside and fed for the morning. So it would cost one nickel. So a candle would have cost that same nickel as having all that luxury of staying in one of the very few, if uh, five or six in the entire colonies at that time, taverns. So. And uh, just a word about the word tavern. Uh, it wasn't really called bar. These were called the equivalent of public houses in England. And that's what Shivers copied was a public house here. Again, he thought he could sell his real estate that was for the king that he was given by the king. So in lieu, Shiver was, was given 50 acres here in the, uh, in the metro, what would become Woodstown area, for his, his brokering, so to speak, of the land for the king-created towns. But anyway, so we're talking about the ambiance of candles. So it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful feel. It's a wonderful hue. It, it's one of those things. I mean, this is, this is art that's a lie because you can be in a situation going through a museum and you're looking at dead paintings, two-dimensional art. Um, you can look at sculpting, which is three-dimensional art. It's coming alive by what the artist feels in his mind coming out of his hand. But very rarely can you be in a, an environment that was 350 years old and feel like it was the day that it was operating in 1669 here in the Shivers House. Phenomenal. So right now we're just going to talk about some of the, uh, some of the furnishings and dwellings. Um, this is a, uh, an early uh, we'll call it a Welch cupboard, a step back cupboard, and it was used, it would have been used by servers, they would have put napkins, they would have put other uh, foodstuffs on here, serving to the patrons. Uh, candles would have been kept in the drawers. Um, on the top, you, you see the plates, spoons, and, and teapots, and tea caddies, etc. So, um, this piece fell into the Shivers Tavern somewhere around 1695, so it was a late addition, but nevertheless, we know that it was here. Um, talked about the cage bar, the drive up window. Now over here we're talking about tavern tables. The original tavern had three tavern tables. It had the capacity to hold about 12 patrons. And you can imagine, so at 12 patrons, this very small tavern table, which is 28 inches by 42 inches, would have had two more chairs. So the chair there and a chair on the other corner would have slipped in. So imagine the tight eating quarters. Plates were smaller. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of uh, accoutrements that would have been put on the table. Um, you know, suppose you were just having mutton. You, you weren't having potatoes and green beans. You were just having mutton in a porridge bowl or on your pewter plate. Uh, and again, all of our, our tableware, knives and forks, uh, are original pewter English, which it would have been from the uh, late 17th, early 18th century. Um, as we span around the room here, around 1700, um, Shivers was, was on the cutting edge. I mean, he was, you know, he was making a lot of money selling land, creating towns. Again, he sold land to Pyle for Pyle's Grove, Penn for Penn's Grove, Carney to Carney's Point. He sold land to John Fenwick. So he started, he provided the land for these hamlets, and he was making money for the king. And uh, so he wanted to have in his tavern around 1700 the latest accoutrement so he could afford for a clock, a uh, horological uh, wonder here and very few people in 1700 knew what a clock was let alone could even read that and tell time but as we look at that we see it's one-handed so the proletariat the people that were coming into this tavern couldn't couldn't tell time but they, they, they knew probably how to count at 1 to 10 1 to 12 and they could hear it ding at the high hour so there was there was and there was no use to have minutes so there's one hand so the clock maker saved um, provided a more economical timepiece by not having to actually cut out the minute hand. So all you do is listen. To, it's close to 5 o'clock. It's close to 6 o'clock. So that's, that's very interesting. But uh, So that's a 30-day clock, and uh, it's around 1700, 1695, out of yew wood made in England with a, a brass chapter ring, single-handed with cast spandrels in the side. 
and the brass dial was on there, particularly the silver chapter ring, was because of candlelight. We needed, we needed enough light to glow, so we needed to see the numerals from across the room, and it could be achieved through the candlelight. Um, and next, we, as we talk next door, we have Windsor-style chairs. Um, we have a, a, a bench, which uh, was for two people. It was probably people waiting to get a, a, chair, a table seat here. And uh, again, there would not have been windows here, but we're using a white and... Uh, white and green check gingham, which would have been very traditional. Very few fabrics were available on a bucolic basis, these type taverns, so that was one of them. And just a word about these tavern goers. Taverns, what was a tavern? What do they, they want a tavern for? A, a tavern, just imagine if you're two, three miles, 10 miles in the wilderness, and this is the only tavern in 1669, and you're a 15-year-old, you're a 20-year-old, and this is the only place that you could find socialization except for your family. So people were Anybody that was in an area of about eight miles was trying to get in here because you could talk to people from a different land. A different land could have been someone 20 miles away. So society started here and in these kind of bucolic taverns and they expanded to urban taverns like Philadelphia in Wilmington, New York City. And it took time and we must remember that taverns were located every eight miles. And a lot of this was set up on the postal routes such as the ones by ben, the Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Um, every eight miles, a horse could only go eight miles. So you'd come and you'd ride your eight miles, you'd stay at a tavern, your horse was kept out back and boarded and fed. But if you wanted to continue on for that same type of money, you could go out and what you could do was you could actually trade in a horse. So you would come, get a quick meal, get a quick, uh, quick drink, and be on a new horse to the next tavern and do 16 miles in that day. So. Um, so anyway, I think that finishes it up here at this side of the, the, uh, the bar and cage room in the tavern. Let's take a walk over to the other. Continuing around the room, uh, we're, we're seeing one of our round tables here in, in total place setting, you know, with all the, uh, the, the knife, fork, et cetera, the mugs and things of that nature. And uh, taking a quick look at the corner cover, just for storage, coffee, teapots, and we talked earlier about the, you know, the, whether you call them employees or, you know, people that... Uh, John Chivers was dealing with, he was making candles. And there are some of his candle balls there. So how interesting is that? That's a, that's a wonderful thing. I, I wanted to just uh, mention a few things about tavern life here. Um, taverns had uh, multifunctional purposes be, be, be in addition to the socia socializing we were talking about earlier. Taverns were your post office. So in, in the cage bar, you would have had any mail that you, you may receive one piece of mail in two or three months. Um, it was a pamphlet dropping place. So the writers coming through, bringing news from Philadelphia, from New York, from London, uh, a pamphlet would come. Again, once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. But people would check in periodically to see what news was happening with the revolution or, or what building is happening, is the king coming, and, and this kind of information. It was a place of worship at times. It was a, it was a courtroom. It would be rented out as a courtroom in the day at times. Uh, and it was a place where political groups met. And most importantly, political groups or what side of the aisle, when we're saying which side of the aisle, are we talking about the British, um, the Crown, the Loyalists would meet here, and or would the, uh, would the colonists meet here? So you have this issue of um, whoever is in charge of a particular area, we could be talking about what would become Woodstown or what would become Philadelphia, what group is in charge? If the British were occupying Philadelphia, then they, where they would meet was in the taverns, and that's where all the military planning, the scheming was done, and things of that nature. But don't forget, that tavern owner, he was a colonist, and uh, at times that colonist would be paid greatly by, uh, you know, someone in Washington's army to, uh, to get espionage. Um, so, but maybe he was a loyalist and he wouldn't do it. So uh, these things are very interesting. And you, you also at times would have had pamphlets being in the larger taverns, which have been located in Philadelphia, Wilmington, New York City. They would have had printing presses of the day downstairs or in the attic. So they're printing propaganda. And most of it was fake news. It was not real news, um, just like we have today sometimes. Uh, but so the, the tavern was putting out political information, um, information about uh, religions and things like that. So it was the all-encompassing community center 
in the area and with very few dwellings people called houses. So um, America really started here. Colonial America started in taverns, all taverns. We're not just talking about the sign of the key tavern. We're talking about taverns from the inception of 1669 when this was built up until 1710 or so. And uh, just a word about some of the people that would come to the taverns, most were illiterate. So the tavern owner would actually pay someone who was readable, um, well, semi well read for the time, maybe with a fifth grade level, to come and to read the pamphlets to all the illiterate people. So they would know a certain time when a reading was going to happen. And for the entire day, this person would read the same pamphlets over and over again. And, and for the patrons coming in and out, coming in and out. So it was a place to get your information and to see where you stood in the world. Um, and all that information would have been held at the cage bar. And even in a tavern like this, you would have had signage that wasn't written, you know, enter or to exit or, you know, the beverage choice. Um, it wasn't, it would have been a signboard with, uh, you know, with a pig for pork that was being served today because no one knew how to read or what pork, what, how it was spelled. So that's how illegitimate, um, illiterate our people were back then. And uh, so, and, and uh, I think we're, uh, we're about done here with the tavern, but uh, thanks for joining us for uh, uh, somewhat unfortunate, maybe an extended stay, but a lot of good hardcore information going back to the 17th century. Thanks to John Shivers, uh, thanks to Samuel Shivers who moved this house here and kept it intact and all the custodians that have really kept this dwelling intact over the years. It's still standing. There's could, a lot of things that could have taken this place down. And, uh, and hopefully my efforts don't go in vain. I've been uh, in a restoration program for this, a sympathetic restoration program for four years. All like materials are being used on the sign of the Key Tavern as well as the Shivers House Museum. Time materials and techniques, hand planes, hand carving tools, hand chisels, axes, ads, and things like that three-phase plastering, timber framing, cedar shakes on the roof. So uh, trying to do this as good as possible for generations to come can appreciate where our colonial roots came for. And at this time, here in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. Thanks for watching.